Okay, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation to share my thoughts with you on the tensions between East and West. Now, I heard Evangelos refer to his age at the beginning of his presentation, and he said that he's 77 years old. You look much younger. <laughs> I'm 27 years old. <laughs> and it would be a challenge to bring to to build a bridge with your presentations. You covered a lot of things that I want to say indirectly, and some parts of your presentation reminded me of a quotation by Socrates talking about East and West. Socrates had said once that I am not an Athenian, I am not a Greek, I am a global citizen. So we need to be global citizens during these tense times that we face during this pandemic. But moving on, let me declare that I'm an economist and as such, my presentation will be focused on free trade, which is an integral part of economics, as we know. And I also, I'm going to dig a bit deeper and act like a historian a bit but that's not my area of expertise. However, it relates to my presentation about a historical roadmap of free trade. And in the beginning, I'm going to talk about the challenges during the crisis, meeting new equilibrium conditions, or finding a new balance if you like, keeping an open and trustful global economy, a review of historical and philosophical underpinnings of trade by making reference to Plato and Confucius. Uh, a reference to the Silk Road, which historically goes back to Alexander the Great and the Han Dynasty. I want to talk also about the rise of mercantilism in the 16th to 18th century, which became the reason for the development, uh, the development of a school of free trade and the theories of free trade attributed to Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Frederick Bastiat and others. And I also want to talk in the end about today's pandemic and the temptation to deal with it by building walls or lines, if you like, pencil lines. I like that term by Evangelos in his summary, among nations from uh, between the East and the West. And then I want to conclude by basically saying that we should try and refrain from mercantilism. Mercantilism is a term that we use to describe tendencies to restrict trade between nations, East and the West in this case. So moving on, I want to talk about the challenges during the pandemic crisis. And I think there are two challenges that we face. The first one is having to deal with a health crisis in a way that it does not impact negatively on the fabric of the economy because there are consequences, negative consequences from having an economy run down. And this is what most governments trying, are trying to do right now. And we also have evidence that certain economies are shrinking uh, from the World Bank. So that's the first challenge. And the second challenge, as I was saying earlier, is to try and refrain from the eternal temptation in international trade, which is protectionism, uh, to develop barriers among nations, to stop trade in goods and services if you like, and indirectly to stop uh, developing a cultural bridge between nations. Uh, and by the way, I was reading today in the newspaper that 
in dealing with the pandemic in Australia, there has been some good news in the sense that surprisingly, our unemployment rate has fallen by one percentage point and jobs are being created uh, uh, at, at this point of time, according to the evidence. And that's good because, you know, our neighbors, Indonesia, who are one of, my, uh, of our most important trade partners, will feel good about it as we will about their economy growing because if we are both growing, there is trade in goods and services which benefit the citizens of both nations. And uh, as we know, Australia, I'm not sure whether it's in the west or the east. North, south. Uh, <laughs> I think we are part of the Asia Pacific. Uh, Australia has a good and strong trade <laughs> relationship with our friends in Indonesia. Okay, so moving on, I want to talk about. Uh, oh, let's. Um, Evangelos on the left hand side, Confuc is in middle, and. <laughs> And uh, Aristotle on the right hand side. Now, on the left hand side, it's Plato and Confucius and Aristotle. And they all have something in common. And I want to discuss that. Now, uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. Uh, what is central to the thinking and the wisdom of these three gentlemen is the concept of moderation. That is, we need to live in a society in a harmonious way. We, of course, need to pursue wealth and we need to have goods and services. But in addition, we must value our friends. We have to have knowledge. And in doing so, we are pursuing a life characterized by moderation. Now, if you go back to my previous comment, about the challenges we face these days in the middle of the pandemic one of the things that we're trying to achieve is moderation because we have come to realize that it's missing in our life and our focus primarily has been one where we focus mostly on wealth for example as an economist, I can tell you that when we look at happiness in a typical second year microeconomics course at the university, we define happiness as being related to our consumption of goods and services. All of those things mentioned by Plato and Confucius, which relate to moderation, are missing from the economic definition of happiness. Now, that is not to say that we neglect happiness. Governments do have a welfare state. We do have a health system. We do try to bring people together. But my, our main focus is materialistic. It has been mostly on increasing our GDP, uh, then trying to find a moderation in terms of how we deal with other important components. Oh.
Hello. What ha- what what happened to Patrick Doctor Bartalis? Is still out? Okay, while we wait for Dr. Batten to join us again, I hope that he will come back soon because it is one of the challenges when we are having this online is we are totally depending upon uh, electricity, we are depending upon internet and uh, we are uh, at the mercy of this technology. <laughs> are we having Dr. Batten today? Hello, Dr. Lakan. Are you here? Hello. Yes. <laughs> my, my apologies. Uh, no worries, no worries. My, I, I just realized that I had not put the cable on the electricity <laughs> power point because no I, had to move, I had to move my laptop. Where is it? Where is the point close? Okay. Is the bank there? Yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. You may continue. Okay, you I can cannot continue. speak. Okay, okay. my problem is again. Okay, no, no. Let, okay, I'm going to continue with my discussion. Huh. And so, I was trying to, to build a bridge between the Confucius and Plato and Aristotle concept of moderation, which we need to deal with today and the challenge we face which is uh, uh, trying to find a balance with uh, uh, the health crisis and uh, maintaining uh, a economy. Okay, Plato, which is not very well known and which went unsurpassed until the 18th century when Adam Smith picked up on this point, on this concept, was the first philosopher to talk about the importance of division of labor. Now, when we talk about division of labor in in international economics, we basically are saying that citizens ought to cooperate with each other uh, by placing a focus on what they are good at or their competitive advantage if you like and also he did argue back then that that cooperation should extend between states cities and nations uh, and in other words he was arguing for what we refer to these days as free trade. It's as simple as that. And that particular argument of free trade is one that we need to try and maintain in terms of the, uh, uh, in terms of uh, having a connected East and West. Uh, let's can you, can you, can I bypass this slide, please, for the moment? Can you move on to the next slide? Okay, so, uh, so we have Plato, uh, mainly, and Confu- Confucius to a lesser extent, arguing in favor of interconnected world, in favor of free trade, and it's not an accident that historically free trade was observed to unfold itself during the times of the Han Dynasty and Alexander the Great, because they both contributed to the trade of free, uh, to the free trade of goods and services, but not only goods and services, uh, cultural connections, scientific connections that enhanced the growth of the economies along the Silk Road, such as China, 
India, Persia, Arabia, Greek, Greece, and Rome. So let's move on, please. Yeah, and also besides the development of the Silk Road as a free trade route, we characterized those times. Uh, there were a lot of Hellenistic cities that were founded by Alexander the Great in the spirit of Plato, which was to have people cooperate among themselves, but also with other nations. And there's a paper that I have referred to in my presentation by de Mauriac in 1949, which he said in which he says that Alexander the Great, because he strongly believed that comics unites people, was the first to use a common currency which became the means of comics among nations and people during his reign. I mean, we talk about a common currency. We all know what a common currency is. If you go to the European Union, uh, you will find that all nations within the European Union use a common currency, the euro. Uh, well, it is in fact Alexander the Great that understood the importance of free trade among nations that adopted a common currency during the era that the Silk Road was the road that was connecting nations in terms of trade, but also in terms of uh, developing cultural connections. Okay. Next slide. Uh, now here is a slide, which is a map of the Silk Road, the ancient slick Silk Road. Uh, on the left hand side, it is specific to the connection between China and Greece, which are two of the most well known ancient civilizations. Uh, and you can see the land road and you can see the maritime road. And uh, silk roads on the top left hand side. Draw me to black shoe. It means Silk Road in Greece, in Greek. And uh, yeah, and on the right hand side, you've got a, a, a more enhanced version of a map of the ancient Silk Road, which uh, includes other nations uh, that were an important part during that period of time, like Afghanistan. Uh, Iraq, Syria, Turkey, Greece, all the way to Italy, and China, of course. And to a lesser extent, it appears it was Pakistan and India. Now, sticking to the map on the left-hand side, which talks about a land road and a maritime road, as being an integral part of what was known as the Silk Road, you may be aware that China these days is trying to revive that ancient Silk Road through its well-known One Belt, One Road strategy, which is basically to develop infrastructure uh, in, along the ancient Silk Road so that all those nations which have fallen behind a bit economically, uh, like Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Iraq, and others, can be, and Syria, which is facing a lot of uh, turbulent times these days, can be revived economically. And I think that's a good thing, even though uh, China has been put under the spotlight for um, this initiative for various reasons, which I will not discuss at this stage. So let's move on to the next slide. Thank you. Now, from the Silk Road onwards, I'm going to 
jump a little to the 16th and 18th century, what we had was the development of mercantilism during the 1500s. Now, mercantilism, to clarify, is the idea that if you are a nation, you should export as much as possible and import as little as possible because that way you increase your wealth by being ex an exporter mainly, but importing very little. Now, why was that safe thinking so prevalent during those days? Because during those days, the wealth of a nation was measured in terms of what stock of gold and silver or precious metals they had. It was not measured by making reference to the gross domestic product like we do today. And therefore, if you export a lot and you import a little, you increase your stock of gold and silver and you become rich. And it was the thinking that was prevailing at that point of time with nations that were pursuing that kind of thinking being primarily Western European, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Britain, as well as Germany and Netherlands. And I would like to uh, have Evangelos later on pick up on this point, namely how did that approach impact on the nations that were colonized uh, during that mercantilist period. Okay, thank you. Now, it was against the background of mercantilism during the 15th century onwards that in 1711, 1776, which was the period of time during which David Hume lived, that he first challenged mercantilism. And he basically said, consistent with the thinking by Confucius and Plato, that it's not the way to go. The best way to go is to have free trade among nations because mercantilism results in an outcome where you have got rich nations and poor nations. There is divide. There is no middle class and we need to have a middle class. Otherwise, we have the governments and special interest groups manipulating um, members of society. And David Hume was basically espousing the benefits of free trade in the same way as we had along the Silk Road that I described earlier, but he was also supported later on by Adam Smith. Adam Smith developed the theory of absolute advantage to favor the benefits of free trade, followed by David Ricardo, who talked about the theory of comparative advantage, uh, a French economist or philosopher, Frederic Bastiat, and later on many others uh, uh, made points along the same spirit. And so we have got today's pandemic now, and we have got the rise of neo mercantilism tendencies. Okay, there is a lot of uncertainty during this period of time. People will blame each other for what's happening. Uh, nations will point the finger at each other uh, during this period of uncertainty. And especially there is aggression in terms of developing protectionist walls between the United States and China. And the United States is an integral part of what we call West, while China is an integral part of what we have been calling East. And those two powers 
are um, in disagreement and in order to deal with that kind of disagreement that we face they propose among other things to develop walls among nations to stop trade by increasing tariffs uh, uh, quotas etc but you know if we go back a little i talked about mercantilism in the 15th century and how bad it was and then before we had the Silk Road, which brought people together and it was a good thing. And we know from history that to stop free trade or to reduce it, if you like, because we, can, we cannot stop it. It has uh, become an integral part of our, of, of our lives now. But even to reduce it is a bad thing. We should not try and do it. Uh, uh, and this now mercantilist tendencies that we observe now must subside. Uh, it's not the way to move forward. Uh, and I also note that according to evidence provided by various institutions like the International Monetary Fund, the Asian countries are expected to make uh, the top five I can see, um, countries in the world by, in terms of GDP in 2020, by 2024, uh, relegating European economic powerhouses uh, power to lower ranks. So, you know, Asia is rising, it's becoming more and more important economically. So, the East is moving forward. And for that reason, too, we need to have the free trade channels open. Thank you. Let's move on to the next slide. OK. OK, what, what, what I would really like to say here is something very simple. If we look at various indices, that compare the East and the West in terms of where they are now in the middle of the pandemic economically, we will see that Asian countries, including China, are doing extremely well in terms of their economic complexity and also in terms of their innovation uh, complexity uh, as reflected in various indices like the Atlas of Economic Complexity. And for that reason, they have become even stronger trading nations. Uh, and furthermore, the, mid the middle class has been on the rise uh, in Asian countries. There is not so much a divide between the, the rich and the poor that we will observe if we have got a stop on free trade and we have got wealthy nations competing with poor nations like during the period of mercantilism and yeah that, 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 that is very important in terms of describing the um, advantages of the Asian countries during these times okay uh, thank you. I want to move on to the next slide. Okay. Uh, the summary of findings and conclusions, basically things that I have been saying up to this point of time, when we look at the history, we need to try and learn from it that creating a divide between East and West would not be a good thing. However, uh, I also need to add that I was looking yesterday at some evidence regarding the population of the continents, because it occurred to me, you know, uh, where is the West, where is the East, which is the same question that Evangelos put to us at the beginning of his presentation. And 
It's a good question. Where is the East and where is the West? Is Australia in the East or in the West? I think we are now realizing that we are a member of the Asia Pacific. We belong, let's say, to the East, even though my main point is we should all be global citizens. However, I noted that the East, which is part of this, which is usually referred to as being Asia, is 60% of the population. In terms of market size, the East being Asia is 60% of the population of the world. Now, then I looked at East Asia because the, the, the tensions are primarily between East Asia, where China is, and the West. And East Asia is 21% of the world population. And then I looked at the West, and I thought that the West, it's fair to say, is, the Europe, is Europe plus the United States. Now, Europe and the United States together, including Russia, is about 14% of the world population. So, if, if, we, if we think of East and West being defined along those lines, if you draw a pencil line between the East and the West, and you, hypothetically speaking, stopped free trade between East and West, but you allowed East to trade, uh, nations in the East to trade, and nations in the West to trade, but there was no trade between East and West, who would benefit more? Who would benefit more? East would benefit more, because its middle class is rising very fast. And also, uh, it's got a huge advantage in terms of the population. The East Asia is 6% of the population. East Asia on its own is 21% compared with 15% of the West. So it would not be, in any case, in the interest of the West to try to isolate itself from the East because the indicators show that Asia is more likely to move forward compared to uh, Europe and the United States. And I think it will be the advantage of both nations, of both parts of this world to try and resolve their differences and uh, behave like, like global citizens. So I will end my presentation here. Oh, yeah, the last slide, yes, okay, you reminded me of the last slide. Okay, uh, this is a very important point that this map makes, and it basically tells us that China, which is a nation part of the East, having benefited so much from free trade because it has been uh, running consistently trade surpluses, it using a lot of that uh, money, if you like, to revive the Silk Road, but also to extend it. And uh, map is basically describing the infrastructure that is being developed under the One Belt, One Road strategy in order to divide, to, to, uh, to revive the uh, ancient Silk Road about which we talked uh, in my presentation earlier. And uh, you can see it covers most of the world. It's not just a case of the East and the West. And I think, you know, from my perspective, looking at the economic indicators and the history of free trade, I can say putting the tensions that exist among governments these days, I think people basically want to 
put their differences aside and to have uh, uh, a, a culturally and economically connected world. Thank you.